So good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a tremendous pleasure uh, to be here uh, on my first trip to Israel and to Jerusalem, so that's a great joy. And um, uh, it's a tremendous privilege to help uh, inaugurate the LSAC Center for Brain Sciences. And so I just want to thank the organizers, Idan and Ian, Lehan and Aviv, for the generous invitation. And I also want to add my thanks to Alana for all of the uh, arrangements that have just been working flawlessly so far. And so um, I'll, I'd like to, since I'm the first speaker in the session, I'd like to sort of take the opportunity to frame the talk a bit about evolution. And I think that probably no one in the audience uh, needs to be reminded of this, but uh, we take it as, as a given that we don't see the world the way it really is. And to illustrate that, you can use the example of how the shark sees the world. Uh, a shark hears its prey more than a kilometer away. Uh, it smells its prey more than 100 meters away. It feels its prey up to 100 meters because of sensory, uh, sensory neurons on the skin and can actually sense the electrical activity of its prey at a distance. And we don't even know what that would feel like. And so sense for a shark is acts at a distance, which is something that's completely unfamiliar to humans. Uh, it tastes its prey before ingesting it because it has taste buds on the outside of its body. Uh, and then it only ever really sees a blurry image at near range. And so the shark has a, a vision of the world that we can't even conceive of, uh, which is dominated by senses that we don't even have. Uh, and so in a similar way, we don't see the world the way it really is either. Our visual system enhances edges. There are certain colors that we can't hear, sounds, it's colors that we can't see, sounds that we can't hear. But our brain and its sensory organs were selected to be most useful for our particular way of life. Uh, and so every animal constructs a view of the world through its brain and sense organs. Uh, and that's reflected in the structure of the brain uh, as well. And you can see the tremendous variability in the size and shape of the brain, even just among mammals. Of course, humans are notable for the fact that our brain has increased uh, massively. Uh, almost tripling in size compared to our nearest living relative, the chimps, uh, over just the last few million years of evolutionary time. But also, in fact, the stem cells in our brain look totally different than the stem cells in other animals. The turtle has these very simple stem cells. The mouse has a much uh, more primitive, thank you, a variety of stem cells compared to the, to the human. And so how is it that uh, evolution causes these changes to come about, that we go from a species that makes footprints in the Earth to a species that makes footprints on the moon. And so what is it that's unique about the way our nervous system's been put together? Now, this is a tremendously big question, and it'll be a great deal of fun to discuss it over the terms of the conference. But in fact, uh, it's, there, there are different levels on which you, conceptualize, you can conceptualize uh, how evolution works. You can think about what are the evolutionary differences in behavior between humans and non-human species? And this is a tremendously complicated question when you really start thinking about how can we quantitate or systematically analyze behavior? If you consider even the two animals that we've been studying in the laboratory for a century and about which we arguably know more about than any other species, how, do we, how much do we really know about the behavioral differences between a, a rat and a mouse? much less between the behavioral differences between humans and extinct human ancestors, or between even humans and non-human primates? Or how much do we really understand about the differences in the morphology and the anatomy of the brains of different species? Of course, we can't even think about this in terms of extinct species. But in fact, how much do we really know about the de details of neurological organization of the 100 billion neurons in the human brain can, compared to the hundreds of millions of neurons in non-human species? And so this, in many ways, seems like an almost insoluble problem because of the billions of neurons and the thousands of connections of immense complexity that they all have. Now, compare to this the genome. The genome, compared to these issues of behavior and neuroscience, seems almost simple. It's certainly vast, uh, but uh, it's six billion base pairs, but that's actually a lot less than the structure of the brain in terms of numbers of neurons. But at least the genome is finite. We know its size, we know its length, we've sequenced it. It's also digital, and it's mainly linear, and so it has many properties that make it actually much more accessible uh, in a comparative way than studying some of these neuroscientific issues. And after all, it is the substrate 
on which evolutionary changes must be recorded and transmitted from generation to generation. So what sorts of genomic changes underlie evolution? And there are three broad types, uh, and this is probably not a systematic coverage of all of them, but again, as the first talk, I thought I would introduce them. One important mechanism is gene addition or duplication or removal. So this would be, if here's a picture of a genome sequence with a bunch of genes here shown in blue. It would be basically the wholesale addition of a new gene to the genome. And this turns out to be, this you can imagine this would be a very important mechanism of evolution, but it's a relatively rare one because genes are not just sitting around on the table ready to be inserted into the genome. They're more commonly added to the genome uh, by some sort of duplication of an existing gene. Here's the example of RGAP11B, which is a duplication of RGAP11A that then becomes specialized in its sequence and in its function. And so this is a relatively rare mechanism between humans and primates, at least, uh, although it's a very important mechanism. It's one I won't be talking about uh, during my own talk. A more common uh, mechanism of evolutionary change is to take uh, a conserved gene that's present in more than one species and change its amino acid sequence, thus changing its biochemical properties. An important example is FOXP2, which regulates some aspects of speech about which people may, have, may, may be familiar. And in the case of FOXP2, there are two prominent amino acid substitutions uh, between chimps and humans that seems to have important roles in aspects of um, the production of speech. And I'll be talking about uh, other microcephaly genes, which also are conserved in their existence between humans and non-humans, but which are divergent in their uh, primary amino acid structure. And so uh, I'll tell you about a gene we've been particularly interested in now for more than 15 years called ASPM. And uh, this was discovered as a cause of uh, human genetic disease by Jeff Woods' lab in England, and we had a small collaborative role in that discovery. And it causes a genetic form of microcephaly where the human brain here is reduced in size by more than 50 percent to about the size of a chimp's brain but is otherwise quite well organized. And so these kids don't usually have seizures. Uh, in fact, they usually learn to uh, walk, and they can uh, often have a few words of language, although their language and intelligence are uh, much reduced. And so after we uh, discovered this gene, we found uh, there, are there are a number of genes with uh, related properties that cause this sort of genetic forms of microcephaly. Uh, and it's been long been an interest as to whether these genes that cause this uncomplicated or primary microcephaly might have been tweaked in small ways during evolution uh, to perhaps contribute to this huge increase uh, in brain size that's occur that distinguishes us uh, from chimps. And in fact, we and others studied the sequence of ASPM and found that, in fact, there was strong statistical evidence that, this, that the protein sequence was under positive evolutionary selection because there was an excess of, of amino acid changing substitutions. Uh, as you, if you compared the human sequence to other sequences, you found this excess of amino acid substitutions, this, these numbers greater than one, indicating that evolution seems to have deliberately altered the sequence of this protein uh, in order to change its biochemistry on the lineage leading to humans. Uh, and this is a very rare occurrence uh, in proteins in general, which generally under very strong negative selection so that any change in the amino acid sequence is generally avoided. So I'll tell you a little bit about what we know about ASPM, how ASPM functions and how it may have functioned evolutionarily. But first I need to tell you about how the cortex develops. It develops from an undifferentiated neuroepithelium, from these progenitor cells, which are called radial glial cells, that generate um, a couple of different, more highly differentiated uh, and less uh, and less undifferentiated progenitor cells called outer radial glial cells and intermediate progenitors. And these eventually then generate the neurons of the cerebral cortex. So we have these apical radial glial, radial glial progenitors that are the most undifferentiated. Uh, and we've known for many years that if you abnormally stimulate the, the proliferation of these radial glial cells in a mouse, you can generate a mouse with a hugely enlarged brain. Uh, that even starts to have things that look almost like gyri, which are the folds that characterize the brain of most uh, non-rodent mammals. And so uh, these neurons of the cortex are generated in an inside-out, outside, out, outside, uh, first, outside, last sequence. So the first born neurons occupy the deepest parts of the brain, and the last born neurons occupy the most superficial aspects of the brain. So this shows what that looks like in a bit more detail. 
the, here, uh, many of the cells have been stained using green fluorescent protein. And again, the, the uh, most undifferentiated ventral or apical radial glial cells are shown here. They extend processes all the way out to the outer surface of the brain, which is shown here. And then there are these more differentiated outer radial glial cells, as well as even more differentiated uh, intermediate progenitor cells. And then you see some of the neurons here migrating out to the cortex. Now, this neuropathelium has a very defined structure where these progenitor cells undergo mitosis along the ventricle, and the ventricle is filled with fluid that actually also contains many growth-promoting factors so that the ventricular surface is an important proliferative niche. And the epithelial cells have cilia that sample the proteins in the CSF, which in turn regulates their pattern of cell division. And then as those progenitor cells move away from the ventricle, they are then isolated from those growth-promoting growth signals and become progressively more differentiated and post-mitotic. And so this is a polarized neuroepithelium with these uh, apical processes here uh, and then basal processes out of the outer surface of the brain. So uh, in order for us to try to figure out what ASPM might be doing to actually regulate the structure of the brain, the natural thing to do is to create a genetic model in mice. And we and other labs have done that over the last few years. And compared to this dramatic reduction in brain size that you see in humans, the mouse seems to be almost indifferent to the presence of ASPM. When you knock it out, the brain is reduced about 10% uh, in size. And so it tells us relatively little about what the brain, the, uh, the uh, gene is actually doing. Now, uh, this is, there are many reasons why this might be. Uh, and uh, for an, an important factor is that mice actually have such a much more simplified brain that they actually lack a major form of progenitor cell uh, that's common in, uh, in, it's particularly common in humans. These are called outer radial glial cells, and they're hugely enlarged in humans. Uh, other sort of conventional mammals, this, I'll use the example of the ferret because I'll be talking about this as a, as a model uh, that's uh, intermediate between mice and humans. They also have these outer radial glial cells. But mice essentially completely lack these outer radial glial cells, and so they have just these uh, more simplified intermediate progenitors here. Uh, and so this might be one reason why um, we thought the, the phenotype might be so uh, subtle in mice because they lack an entire family of progenitor cells that seem to be critical uh, to development, uh, particularly in the human brain. Also because the mice have this such tiny cortex to begin with. Uh, but in fact, another reason is that the, the structure of the ASPM gene is vastly divergent in rodents compared to that of most other mammals. And so uh, evolutionarily, rodents are actually more closely related to humans than our carnivores, such as cats and dogs and ferrets. Uh, you see them over here. And the rodents are actually more closely related uh, to the primate lineage than many other mammals. However, if you look at the sequence of ASPM, this is a complete outlier gene. So ASPM is, in fact, much more similar in, in carnivores than it is to primates than the rodents, which have a very low amount of sequence con this, this chart here shows sequence conservation. I'm sorry that it's not labeled. You see the sequence conservation is much lower in rodents compared to humans than uh, it is, for example, in ferrets compared to humans. And one of the major reasons for this is that the rodent ASPM gene contains a deletion uh, within the gene. Let me build that again. Uh, and it's a deletion of the largest exon. The exons are shown here in black. And rodents have this deletion that makes the protein much shorter. And so here's a schematic of the ASPM protein, which is an extremely large protein. In humans, it has 63 of these domains, which all start with the two amino acids, isoleucine glutamine. And so they're abbreviated IQ repeats. And rodents have only 55 of these repeats. And most mammals, in fact, such as the ferret, have a structure which is more similar to the human. And the rodents have this deletion that removes uh, 10 of these IQ repeats, making a much smaller and structurally divergent protein. Uh, and then actually, in fact, if you look at flies, flies have only 21 of these IQ repeats. Uh, worms have only two of these IQ repeats. And so this has long given rise to the sort of supposition that maybe these more IQs actually make you smarter. 
uh, and that might be not much more complicated than accumulating more IQ domains to raise your IQ. Jeff Woods commented this, this was evidence that God had a sense of humor uh, when, he, uh, when he, uh, he happened to choose these particular domains for regulating brain size. So in order to figure out if ASPM might uh, have different, uh, different functions in other species, we've recently created a, a ferret with a knockout in ASPM. We use genetic engineering to create a variety of deletions in the gene that create frame shifts and null mutations. And ferrets are tremendous animals for studying developmental neuroscience. They have very large litters, as big or bigger than mouse litters. They are born when their cortex is only halfway finished its development, so you can do all sorts of surgical interventions. And their cortex is quite large and gyrated compared to that of a mouse. And so we wondered whether we might be able to learn more about what ASPM is doing. And the phenotype in the ferret is quite dramatic and much more similar to humans. So if you look actually at what exactly happens in, uh, when ASPM is mutated in humans, you find that the area of the cortex is greatly reduced, shown by these red areas, and the entire cortex is greatly reduced in its surface area. But in fact, the thickness of the cortex is affected uh, barely at all. And uh, by the way, this ferret work was led by Matt Johnson and byung Il Bay, two former postdocs in the lab. And so the, almost the exact same thing happens when you knock it out in, in ASPM out in ferrets. The cortex is severely reduced in size, up to 40% reduced in size. And it, the pattern of that reduction remarkably parallels the pattern of evolution of different parts of the brain. So the frontal lobe, for example, which is arguably the most recently enlarged part of the human brain, undergoes the largest reduction in the ferret knockout. The cortical white matter and the corpus callosum, which again are regions that are particularly enlarged in the human brain, are again most severely affected, whereas parts of the brain, like the midbrain uh, or the brainstem, that show very li relatively little enlargement over evolution, are affected barely at all by this mouse knockout. Uh, and again, we see that the surface area of the cortex is greatly reduced. But in fact, the thickness of the cortex is barely reduced at all. Very similar to the human pattern. In fact, that's different than the mouse, where the surface area, as I told you, is barely affected, but the thickness is actually reduced. So losses, the loss of ASPM causes a phenotype that we could never have observed in mice. It causes a dramatic change of one progenitor type, these ventral or apical radial glial cells, to these outer radial glial cells, uh, which, of course, as I told you, is a stem cell type which is not even present in the mouse brain. Uh, and so you can see that shift of the radial glial cells here to, at embryonic day 35 or at postnatal day zero. This is the ventricular surface and the ventricle here. Uh, and you see that there are these dense blobs of cells uh, in this region called the outer subventricular zone uh, at both of these ages. So it's dramatic even in a simple histological stain. You can see it better if you use markers of the proliferating cells as shown here by these displaced progenitor cells that stain for SOX2, which is a proliferative marker. And again, at the day of birth, which is about halfway through neurogenesis, you see these uh, large clumps of displaced uh, cells. And you see that the ventricular zone is correspondingly reduced in size. So there seems to have been a simple shift of one progenitor type, the most undifferentiated, to a more highly differentiated uh, outer radial glial cell type. And these displaced progenitors bear many of the marks of outer radial glial cells. Uh, and just for the specialists among, among the audience, they stain with markers of outer radial glial cells like HOPEX. They have cilia uh, marked by RL13B uh, and so on. I won't go into that in great detail since this has been recently published. Now, what does ASPM? So this tells us that the major phenotype is this progenitor shift uh, from uh, apical to outer radial glial cells. Now, how does that accomplish at a cell biological level? Well, we've also studied the biochemistry and cell biology of ASPM over several years, and this is work of Divya Jayaraman, Jayaraman and byung Uh And so ASPM and a number of other microcephaly proteins form a complex uh, at the centriole or the microtubule organizing centers. Here in M phase, you see that they localize to the centrioles, uh, and they also localize to the centrioles during uh, interphase. And in fact, ASPM particularly localizes to one of the two centrioles, known as the mother centriole, uh, and not to the daughter centriole. And so this seems to be important for how they regulate cell division. But in fact, they also seem to regulate an interaction between the mother centriole and the apical surface, which is that surface, that membrane, which is against the ventricle, against the ventricle. Uh, 
and which contains the cilium, and which uh, again is exposed to those growth promoting uh, those growth promoting substances. So you see here that in a wild type, in fact, gamma tubulin, which marks the centriole, is associated with R13 B, which marks the cilia. And you can, I don't think you can see the colors here, but there are basically dots of green and red that are together. Uh, and you can see along here that basically wherever you see red, you see a green dot that goes with it. Uh, and then in the knockout, we see dots of green that have no red associated or dots of red that have no green associated, and that's quantitated over here, that, AS, that WDR62 and ASPM as well seem to be essential to link together the centriole to the apical membrane complex. Well, here that's shown in a different way. So here you see the apical membrane down here, the centrioles, which actually in this particular phase of the cell cycle would be more lateral, but in interphase, these uh, proteins uh, bind together so that here you see that uh, APKC and PAR6, which are two markers of this apical complex, they actually co-localize with the centriole in the control situation, but then if you remove ASPM, you see that that localization of these apical proteins to the centriole is lost. And so I'm not going to go into this in uh, more detail than that uh, in the interests of time, but basically to summarize, loss of ASPM then causes this shift, it causes a loss of cortical surface area without significant change in thickness or cytoarchitecture. Uh, and so it's a tremendously useful uh, evolutionary mechanism where you can change the size of the cortex without necessarily changing its architecture. It disrupts the centrosomal apical complex, so it basically disrupts the glue that holds the cell to the ventricular surface, and without that glue, the progenitor cells migrate away and be can become more highly differentiated. And so you can imagine then how evolutionarily tweaking that biochemical sequence of ASPM just a little bit might change the affinity of progenitors for the ventri ventricle surface. And as long as those progenitors remain at the ventricular surface, they remain as stem cells and continue to grow the surface area of the cortex. And then every species can choose when it wants those progenitors to move away and start differentiating. So in the, in the last five minutes or so, I'll tell you about other sorts of genomic changes that underlie evolution. The largest part of evolution is probably um, regulated by the non-coding parts of the genome, which change time, place, or levels of gene expression. So these are changes in parts of the genome where there aren't any genes uh, that presumably encode uh, sequences that enhance or repress the expression of nearby genes, and in this example is this sequence, this non-coding change that regulates a gene called frizzled 8, and what happens is in humans, the pattern of expression of this gene when you make a transgenic mouse is different than the pattern of expression of gene uh, in monkeys. So we got interested in non-coding mutation as a source of evolution uh, in 2014, again by work led by byung uh, where we found an, an unusual um, malformation of the human brain that disrupted Broca's area here on the left and the surrounding perisylvian parts of the cortex and, this, and the uh, symmetrical parts of the right brain. So preferentially disrupted these perisylvian cortical regions. And we found that this was actually a non-coding mutation in a gene called GPR56. And GPR56 undergoes this bizarre evolutionary change where uh, between zebrafish and mice and humans, it develops all of these non-coding uh, exon ones, uh, which causes this, the, the fact that it creates uh, uh, more than a dozen different transcripts that all encode the same protein, but that have different patterns of gene regulation. And these families that have this particular mutation, they have a non-coding mutation that disrupts one of these transcripts that seems to direct the gene expression specifically to these perisylvian language areas and not to the rest of the brain. So we wondered whether we could study these Instead of a sort of a one-off pattern like this, can we study non-coding parts of the genome systematically for, for effects on brain evolution? Uh, and to there, we turned our attention to parts of the genome that are called human accelerated regions. Uh, and these represent thousands of stretches of the genome where humans are especially different from other mammals. So most of the genome, you might see uh, sort of random substitutions. This shows sort of the mouse genome, the ferret genome, the monkey genome, and the human genome all aligned. Uh, and in a, in a, a part of the genome that's under no particular sort of selection, there might just be random substitutions in any one of these species. 
There are also parts of the genomes that are, that are completely conserved between many mammals, and that's nature's way of telling you that a part of the genome is important, because if it's highly conserved, it usually means that any sort of substitution is damaging, which means it would create a disease or a phenotype. And then there are parts of the genomes that are highly conserved in non-mammals, but then are different in humans, suggesting that this highly conserved function is a little different in humans than other mammals, suggesting that these uh, regions might have diverged. And these human accelerated regions were really first studied by Katie Pollard and David Hausler, and Katie will be speaking later in this meeting. Uh, and they've been defined by now many different groups so that there are now more than 3,000 of them in the genome. So, so many different sites. How can we define which of these human accelerated regions are the most important uh, and which have essential roles in evolution and which of these sequences might be false positives? And so, we thought, well, if, you know, if HARs are so important, then they should be doing something essential in humans. Uh, and how you can define if a part of the genome is essential in humans is if there's a mutation in it, does it create a disease or a phenotype? And since we have 8 billion people now, or 7 billion people in the world, there's this dense uh, mutational saturation of our genome for mutations at essentially every different locus. Uh, and so Ryan Doan, a, a postdoc, decided to test these HARs to see if we could find people that had a damaging mutation in HARs that might identify uh, a subset of HARs with essential functions. And for that, we actually studied a cohort of patients with autism that were enriched for recessively acting mutations, because we thought recessively acting mutations might be the ones most likely to show damaging effects. And these are families that we've been collecting now for over 10 years from Israel and the neighboring Arabic countries of the middle, of the, particularly in the Gulf region, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Turkey, uh, and the Palestinian parts of the West Bank. Uh, and we go there because marriage between cousins uh, is quite common because of social and cultural traditions, and that increases the risk of recessive mutations about tenfold, and so that uh, it's more likely to be able to identify these recessive mutations uh, in single families that have uh, parental consanguinity, which means relationship of parents, typically as a first cousin, uh, as shown by this family here. And so we found that, in fact, affected probands in these consanguinous families had an excess of rare homozygous mutations in HARS uh, after we sequenced HARS in about over 200 families uh, with autism spectrum disorders, and that this excess was completely accounted for by HARS that had evidence of being active in neurons. And if you looked at HARS that did not show evidence of being active in neurons, there was no excess at all. And we thought that they contributed to risk in as many as 5% of these consanguinous families. And work that's not published, we've now studied more than 2,000 uh, families from all over the world without parental consanguinity. And we continue to see this excess of rare, damaging homozygous mutations in cases compared to controls. Uh, and it, we estimate that it contributes to risk in about 5% of consanguinous families, but actually about 2 or 3% of non-consanguinous families on the autism spectrum as well. And we now have more than a dozen HARs that show more than two different mutations in different families. Just to show you a quick example, this is a, because I'm running out of time, these are two families with autism and intellectual disability. They actually had the same point mutation in this HAR called HAR number 426, which shows, bears marks of being an active enhancer in neural cells. And we had to, and it had been previously identified that this particular HAR was connected to the promoter of a gene called Cux1. Uh, and Cux1 is this paradigmatic dosage-sensitive regulator of neuronal shape and size. Uh, it's expressed preferentially in the upper layers of the mouse cortex. And when you deplete it, the dendrites are simplified. When you overexpress it, the dendrites become more elaborate. So you can imagine how little tweaks in the pattern or the level of expression of Cux1 might make very important changes in the function of the neurons. And so just to close, uh, it looks like human brain evolution involves tinkering at many different loci. Uh, it, was, uh, it was now 40 years ago, Francois Jacob um, basically suggested that evolution acts not as an engineer to make things new out of whole cloth, but instead to tinker on what's already there. There are probably many sites in the genome that are altered just between humans and our nearest relatives. There's addition of a handful of new genes. There are alteration of amino acid sequences of perhaps dozens of different genes. Uh, and uh, for example, this tinkering with the microcephaly protein. And then there are non-coding mutation of potentially hundreds, maybe, maybe even thousands of genes to alter patterns of expression. Uh, and 
I think that ultimately we can use human genetics to identify those changes which have essential neurological functions. So just to conclude by, again, mentioning the people who've done the work, I think I have covered everyone. The, the, uh, the knockout of ASPM was created by John Engelhardt at the University of Iowa uh, and um, was analyzed, uh, again, by the people listed here. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you for this beautiful talk. Questions? Yeah, beautiful talk. Uh, you mentioned the IQ motive, uh, repeats that is reduced in uh, species with lower brain. Uh -huh. As far as I remember, the IQ motif is the calcium calmodulin binding site. Uh -huh. it, is, do you know if it has any relationship to the function of ASPM? Yeah, so that's quite true. The IQ domain is, uh, has been identified as a calcium calmodulin binding site. Um, we, know, we don't know specifically whether the IQ domains on ASPM have that function or whether they are just some sort of um, spacer. You know, there might be just be a, sometimes protein domains like that might not have the biochemical function. It's difficult to do much on the biochemistry of ASPM because it's such a vastly large protein. Uh, you know, it's over 3,000 amino acids in size, so it's difficult to clone, to create a functional full-length cDNA. So we don't but really, uh, there's no one that's been very successful in identifying that much about the biochemistry of it. Um, other than by, so the cell biology is a little easier to study because you can inactivate it relatively easily. Chris, did I get you right that in the ferret ASPM mutation, mm -hmm. you have particular decrease in prefrontal cortex? A particular reduction in frontal yeah. cortex. That's the most severely reduced uh, lobe of the, of the cortex in the ferret. And, yeah. and that is interesting because it's a it's very recent evolutionary acquisition. And maybe you have also a big decrease in, yeah. the, in the parietal cortex. Did you have That's the that? second most. Uh, I can show you again the, yeah. It's, it, again, it, it is quite amazing the way the pattern of reduction of the different parts of the brain uh, parallel our thinking about. Um, So that's shown over here. You see the frontal cortex is the most severely reduced. The corpus callosum is second. Actually, sorry, the lateral cortex is next. Parietal occipital uh, is a bit less. But you see that medial cortex and hippocampus are relatively preserved, consistent with the, with the finding that hippocampus is less evolutionarily enlarged in humans relative to other species. And as I say, the, you know, the parts of the thalamus and the brainstem, uh, which again are relatively static, relatively, in evolution compared to the cortex, are also barely affected by this mutation at all. So a remarkable parallel. Hi. Uh, I wondered about the uh, SPM. So have you tried or you're considering to expand it in the ferret, the IQ domains? Uh, so we've played around a bit with that. We've tried to create you know, a transgenic mouse with a, expressing the human gene, but we haven't had much luck getting it to be expressed. And again, the challenge is it's hard to, the cDNA is so large, uh, it's a little hard to get it. You know, we've put in some backs, but then the backs don't express. So we, we, don't, we haven't been able to get any successful experiments But, but in that. the ferret to expand the IQ domain. That's a good idea. We don't, it, the, I mean, uh, yeah, we don't have like a simple way to make transgenics in the same way we could in the mouse. It, uh, it's great, I, it, I think it's realistic to engineer the ferret yeah. uh, occasionally, but it's a, it's a bit, you know, unwieldy. That we still have to keep them at a distant site and so on. That's a great experiment though. Yes. Yes. So horrors in terms of higher IQ. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, that's a well. That's a great. That's a great question. You know, of course, that's a, um, the much more interesting question. Uh, genetics. You know, geneticists much prefer black and white, and so loss of function is a lot easier to study than gain of function. In terms of higher IQ, the sort of studies would be genome-wide association studies of, um, you know, higher IQ. And of course, those sorts of studies are also a little bit delicate politically. Uh, and so I haven't really been that involved in it. There's some, there is some evidence that some of the signal uh, that relates to educational entertainment has uh, educational attainment. <laughs> has to do with uh, some horror sequences, but there might be, maybe Katie had, uh, might know more about that than I do. <laughs>
to enhance G factor? Oh. Um, yeah. Uh huh. I think it's fair to say that there's not a single strong, highly penetrant phenotype, you know, a single gene that you can use to supercharge intelligence. If so, I'd probably be taking some over the counter. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and again, that may relate to the fact that uh, it's a complex, that it's, it's just very hard to do that. It's, it's rare that a change can, can make the brain better, that the brain is pretty well optimized already. Uh, or it could be that it's just a complex trait that requires interactions of multiple loci. Okay. Um, so we know that uh, compared to archaic human, modern human had an enlargement uh, in uh, the frontal and the parietal lobes. So given what you, what you said before to the question that was before me, did you check if there was any difference uh, in the genome uh, in archaic humans? Um, I don't, you know, we haven't really, I mean, in terms of comparing ASPM and Neanderthal, you know, that's an interesting question. I don't, I, I don't, uh, I, that would be a question for Svante Pabo or something. And uh, I know that uh, I've heard him speak on this, to on this topic, that if you look at the uh, genes that have amino acid substitutions between Neanderthal and humans, I believe that ASPM is not on that list. Uh, it's a list of, I don't know, a couple of dozen genes. However, um, the, one of the categories of encoded proteins that's highest on that list are, in fact, centriolar proteins. There are about six or 12 different proteins of the centriole that have amino acid substitutions. And as I say, there are several centriolar proteins in this microcephaly class that show evidence of positive evolutionary selection. And so um, it's possible that, uh, so, I, so I don't know, if, as I say, I think probably ASPM itself is not, but it's quite possible that other proteins of the same complex are. So we'll take one last question and we'll, no, okay, we will take one last question, if there is one. Um, or not, so I'll, I will, uh, I, I actually have one last question. Okay. So uh, if you do this multiple comparison between mouse, human, and ferrets, uh, looking at the genes that are uh, less conserved in, in, in uh, carnivores, so do you get this enrichment of brain-related genes and can you actually identify novel genes that might be doing this? So, uh, I, oh, so if we systematically yes, look yeah. for genes that are outliers among rodents, exactly. the same way ASPM is. That's exactly. a great, yeah, we've actually, uh, we've tried that approach, um, and we've come up with a few candidates, but we don't, we haven't gotten really good functional validation. In fact, you know, the, the loss of gyri that you see in rodents uh, occurs in a couple of different um, branches of the mammalian mm -hmm. tree. And so, you know, there's good reason to think that the presence of gyri is the ancestral state. Uh, and that, that the loss of gyri is actually a specialization. In the case of you know, my rodents, my own belief is that they're incredibly highly um, evolutionarily evolved, uh, and they're really perfected, but they're, the purpose for which they're evolutionarily evolved is to crawl into holes that are too small for cats and ferrets to get into. <laughs> and so they're under intense evolutionary selection to have the smallest possible brain that still works for everything they need to do. Uh, and so. Uh, and, and similarly, the other branches that lose gyri seem to have uh, their own reasons for having small heads. Um, and so I'd, I'd like, we should come back to that and do more of that. I think that that could be a very useful strategy. Thanks. Thank you very much.